Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 says, At that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins, ten young maidens, who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish. The Greek word is moros, where we get the word moron from. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps and did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time coming. A long time in coming. And they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom. Some versions say, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Come out to meet him. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this space that we have to be in your presence. And as we have an opportunity to study your word again, challenge us, open our eyes, open our hearts, that we might simply know you better. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, amen, amen. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. How often have we heard this parable? How often? Brother and Sister Klein, how often? How often have you heard this parable in light of the second coming that we need to be prepared and we need to make sure that we have enough in our lamps, enough oil to last till the very end? It's very interesting because this has often been used to make sure that we are over-prepared for Jesus' second coming. Now, I'm going to be really honest with you. There is, there is a, uh, a science to precision, and I think there is something that's very economical about being precise. In other words, these ten virgins were invited to the same wedding, and though the five who were called foolish might be seen by many as foolish, some could say they were, again, being very efficient. There's no reason to take extra oil. We know when the wedding is to take place. Why be wasteful? We just need enough. And they stored enough in their lamps based on the wedding invitation. How many of you have been invited to a wedding and it didn't start on time? Anybody? Anybody been there before? Come on now. I've officiated, I feel like, hundreds of weddings. And they only but one started on time. And the one that started on time was a form, former Navy officer. And I was like, oh, of course. Right? Started exactly on time. Um, but usually they're, they're, they start late. About a half hour late is usually the average, some an hour. Um, but that is to be expected. But have you ever attended a wedding that started so late that everyone fell asleep? Like, I'm just going to keep it real. If the wedding started that late and everyone fell asleep, I'm going to blame the bridegroom and the bride on this one. Hello? So I I get that it's a parable, and I get what Jesus is trying to intimate, but I'm going to be honest with you. This is another level of lateness, another level of tardiness. It almost feels disrespectful and inconsiderate to show up that late when we all know when it's supposed to start. But the five who take extra oil are considered wise because they prepared for this occasion. Now, this is interesting because... It's one thing to take enough oil if you think the wedding's going to start maybe an hour late or two hours late. But to take enough oil that that it would start so late that everyone fell asleep is they, they knew the bridegroom might be that late. That's like another level of CPT. And I don't want to explain that to anybody, but those who know, know, right? Just talk to people after the service if you don't know. So... I'm going to be honest with you, just from the, from the jump, I kind of feel like there's something that's just a bit amiss. But the Bible does say that they hear, behold, the bridegroom cometh, come out and meet him. Verse 7 says, then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. <clears throat> no, they replied. There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go out to those who will sell oil and buy some for yourselves. Now, I don't know what 
is open at this time of night selling oil. I don't think there's a 24-hour Walmart at this time. It's midnight, right? The midnight midnight cry rang out. So it's midnight. But they say, go and buy some from those who will sell and then come back. But the Bible says that while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. And later the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said. Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I do not know you. Truly I tell you, I do not know you. But you knew him well enough to invite him to the wedding, right? You knew them well enough that they would be included on the invitation list. So there, there, there was some knowledge of who these individuals were. Now, you may say the bridegroom may not have known only the bride. Maybe it was people of, of her entourage, her family. But I have to say that they, they had to be known enough to be included. But why would he say he does not know them? This is very familiar to Matthew chapter 7. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus echoes something very similar. He says, not everyone, verses 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Okay, I get it. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, just like the foolish virgins said to the bridegroom, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Question, is prophesying in the name of God the will of God? I would say so. Did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons? Can I stop there again? Is driving out demons in the name of Jesus doing the will of the Lord? I would say so. And in your name perform many miracles. Seems like that would be aligned with God's will as well to prophesy, to cast out demons, and perform many miracles. And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evil doers. Now, wait a second. Jesus, based on my understanding of Scripture, it doesn't look like prophesying is evil, especially when it's in your name. And it doesn't appear that casting out demons is evil. You even say, Jesus, that the devil will not cast out his own. A house divided against itself cannot stand. And performing miracles doesn't appear to be evil. That's blessing others. That's exactly what Jesus did in his ministry. So how can you call them evil doers? This sounds similar to Matthew chapter 5, which is the beginning of this sermon in chapter 7, the beginning of it where Jesus says, if your righteousness does not exceed that of the Pharisees, You cannot have any part of the kingdom. You will not not be able to enter it. When people read the Sermon on the Mount, it almost sounds like Jesus makes it that much more difficult to get into heaven. You have heard, do not commit adultery. I tell you this, don't even lust. You have heard, do not murder. I tell you this, don't even hate. Jesus tells us that that, that no more will an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth work as far as law is concerned. You must turn the other cheek if someone strikes you. He makes it more difficult, not easier. And when the rich young ruler in Matthew 19 approaches Jesus and asks him, what must I do, good teacher, to enter into heaven? He says, why do you ask me concerning what is good? There's only one who is good. Okay, bet, bet, one who's good. I'm assuming it's Jesus, right? He's the only one who is good. But Jesus kind of goes along with the rich young ruler. He says, keep all the commandments. He says, which ones? And Christ begins to rattle off commandments that are found in the Torah. The man says, I have kept all of them perfectly. What else do I lack? Jesus then pulls out a commandment that does not exist in the Old Testament. He's like, okay, cool. Yeah, you've kept everything perfectly. Now do this one thing. Sell everything you have, give the money to the poor, and follow me. The man was quite rich. We know this story. 
And the man could not give up his wealth. So he goes away sadly. Did Christ make it easier for the man or make it more difficult? In the Sermon on the Mount, did he make it easier for the people or did he make it more difficult? In the parable of the ten virgins, does he make it easier or does he make it more difficult? I'm telling you, people who think that Jesus shows up and it's all sweet and nice and they call him teddy bear Jesus, you know, no matter what you do, he just wraps his warm arms around you. I think he's, he's more difficult than the Father is represented in the Old Testament. And I know Christ is in the Old Testament as well, but we've kind of seen a distinction between God, who is the Father, who's more judgmental, and Jesus, who is nicer and sweeter. But Jesus comes along and he makes it more challenging. How are you going to tell me I am not known by you when I am working in your name? I'm prophesying and I'm casting out demons and I'm performing miracles. When you invite me to the wedding and I show up and I bring enough, it's you who are late. The Bible continues in Matthew 25, verse 13. Matthew 25, verse 13. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. The disciples ask for specificity. Lord, tell us when this is going to happen. And he rattles off some specific events, some signs of the times that are going to be very clear for the believers of that day to observe and to respond. But he says to them in Matthew 24, of my second coming, no one knows the day or the hour nor the Son of Man. I don't even know it. But, again, if we're friends, if we're friends, wouldn't it be respectful for you to tell me when you're going to show up? I'm just saying, I get those who may not be on the inside, but for those who are close, wouldn't it be respectful and considerate to say, hey, I'm going to show up on this day, be ready. And I would say, you got it. Why wouldn't Jesus tell us when he's showing up? Why wouldn't he give us a message beforehand? Hey, I may run into traffic, LA traffic, they got the parade going on, it's gonna be really congested, wedding may not start on time. Wouldn't that be considerate, anybody? Why do you think Jesus won't tell us when he's coming? Anyone? I'm going to tell you something. Christ doesn't make it easier. He seemingly makes it more challenging. He tells the disciples in Matthew 19 concerning the rich young ruler, it is harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of, of heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. The disciples understand what Christ is saying. They say, Lord, who then can be saved? And that's what I get to ask you today. Who then can be saved? It's interesting, the statement that is made about not knowing them. I would assume, just reading the account, that the reason why the five young women aren't invited into the house is because they were too late. How many would say that? They're just too late. Anybody? They're just too late. That seems reasonable. They were too late. The invitation was given to everybody, was offered to them as well, and they just didn't show up on time. How many would say it's because they didn't have enough oil? Anybody? willing to say just they didn't have enough oil. Well, that doesn't work because by the time they come back, they do have enough oil. So they have enough oil. So it's a timing issue, right? Is salvation a timing issue? Could people be lost because they didn't come to Christ soon enough? They didn't make up their mind soon enough? That's not what the bridegroom says. The bridegroom actually expresses exactly why they're not allowed into the house. It's not because they don't have enough oil. 
It's not because they're too late. It's for one reason and one reason alone. What is that reason? He does not know them. He doesn't know them. Which means, conversely, that they don't know him. All right, let's play this out in a modern scene. Let's play this out in a modern, modern scene, okay? You invite me to your wedding, right? And you have somebody else who's going to officiate, and I'm like, that's so cool. I'm good. I just want to show up and celebrate. And so on my way to your wedding, I'm eating some food because I know your food is going to come way too late at night. I know how this goes down. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get something from Taco Bell. And as I'm eating my little veggie burrito, I get some sauce on my pants. And I show up at the wedding, and I'm like, this is going to be so embarrassing. I'm wearing a light gray suit. I got this sauce on my pants. And the wedding's about to start. And I'm like, you know what? Listen, I'm just going to race home. I'm going to get a new pair of pants, and I'm going to come back to the wedding. And so by the time I get back to the wedding, the ceremony's already over. And I see you, and you're taking pictures. I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. I got some of that red sauce from Taco Bell on my pants, and it, I, it, I just, it, was just, it was embarrassing. So I needed to get a new pair of pants. So I ran home. I'm sorry I missed the ceremony, but I'm here now. How would you feel? How would you feel? You feel bad? Would you have cared if I showed up at the wedding with the stain on my pants? What would you prefer, me to have a new pair of pants and miss the wedding or go with my stained pants and catch the wedding? Right. One scenario says, I care more about how I look than I care about you. And the other scenario says, I might be humiliated, but I would never miss your wedding for any reason. Right? Isn't that what it says? Right? So when the Dodgers were in the process of winning the World Series, I was at prayer meeting. Amen? I had just flown in from New York. I went to go coach the uh, middle school football team, got to my house. I watched one inning with my friends who were up there in the balcony, and then I had to run to prayer meeting. And we had the longest prayer meeting I have ever had at this church. <laughs> but I never checked the score while I was studying. And we had a good discussion. We were in it. We were just, we were in it. So, 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 so here's the thing. If I had told the church, we're canceling prayer meeting tonight, what would I have been saying? What's more important? Right. So, so, so this is really, this is really critical. <clears throat> by the fact that they did not show up with extra oil and by the fact that they went to go buy some and risk me missing the ceremony, they were already showing what type of relationship they had to the bridegroom. See, this is the problem with these stories. See, see when we look at the law, the Torah, the Ten Commandments, right, that is basic rudimentary stuff. That's elementary stuff. This is don't pull one another's hair when you're in kindergarten. Remember those rules? But do you know they never give those rules when you're starting in corporate America? They never say do not pull hair of your cubicle buddy. They, they, I have, I've, been to, I've been in many different conferences. Not once have I read any of the bylaws that say do not pull the hair of associate pastors. Now, is it because it's permissible? Of course it's not. But there's certain things you say on a very rudimentary level for children, babies, people who have been enslaved for 400 years, now coming out of bondage, and God is like, listen, I'm going to give you guys just some basics to hold you over until I can explain more to you. And many of us look at the laws, look at God's requirements, and we're never really wanting to get to the heart of the issue. We want to stay right here. And Adventist Christians, boy, we are so cerebral. 
We want to ask questions like, Lord, what must I do in order to be saved? You notice the difference? What must I do in order to be saved? Just tell me what I have to do in order to be saved. The man already let Jesus know where he was. And that's why Christ tried to set him straight. He says, man, there's only one who is good. What are you trying to do being good? Why are you trying to go that route? There's only one who is good. And this is critical for us because many of us become enamored with how things look and appear to people. So we want to be fruitful, right? We hear about the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. Jesus says we'll be known by our fruits. So this becomes really necessary if we're going to be a Christian that we act right. We show people that we know how to do right. But Christ is always able to look at us, even with all of our good deeds, and he can say, you're still a bad tree. You see, because if I do the good thing for the wrong reason, it doesn't mean I'm converted. If I feed the homeless person because I want you to think that I'm a good person, or I feed the homeless person because I want to get into heaven, I'm not feeding the homeless person because I actually care about him. I feed the homeless person because I care about myself. You're just a means to an end. If this is what I have to do in order to be saved, then I'll do it. And Christ has always tried to get us from here to here, and that is often the longest, furthest path from our brain to our heart. And, 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 and this is what's so critical about the Sermon uh, on the Mount. Christ was basically saying, I, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to make it real. I came to fulfill it. I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets. I want this thing to, to be alive and breathing. I want you guys to really understand this. Adultery doesn't start here, it starts here. So I'm getting to the heart of the issue. I'm telling you, don't lust. If you don't lust, you won't commit adultery, amen? Oh, I didn't, that wasn't a strong amen at all. <laughs> if you don't covet, watch this, if you don't covet, you won't commit adultery either, will you? Hello? He's getting to the heart of the issue. This is why Jesus says all of the law can be summed up in this. Love God, love your neighbor. The heart of the issue. And what those five foolish virgins do is basically say, we're not in this for you. We care more about how we look. If they knew the bridegroom, watch this, and I'm going to say something that's going to make you, make you kind of tilt your head a little bit. But if they knew the bridegroom, knew him, knew him. And know this, the bridegroom is Jesus Christ. Amen? If you know Jesus and you knew his parables, what should you have done once you realized you didn't have enough oil? What's the first thing you should have done? Huh? Stay. All the other parables about weddings, Jesus had enough for everybody who showed up. He had wedding garments. He had everything you needed. All you needed to do was show up. You see, because when you have a relationship, you're not worried about the stain on your pants. Hey, this is going to make me look a little silly. It's going to make me look like I'm a little sloppy and I was unprepared. I probably should have eaten this lunch at home. My bad. But I know you. And I know you'd rather me be here than not be here. So I'm just going to ask you to be forgiving. The stain's going to look really bad. Hopefully you can Photoshop it out. But, but, but I know you'd rather me be here, so I'm showing up. Have mercy. The problem with a lot of these individuals, Lord, did we not? Did we not? What are they saying when they say, did we not? What are they saying to, 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 to Jesus? Lord, did we not? What are they saying? We've earned it. We deserve it. We've done enough. But if they knew the Lord, they really knew Jesus, they wouldn't say, Lord, did we not? they say, Lord, did you not? Is not your grace sufficient? Aren't you going to finish the work you began in me? Will not your word return to you void? I, I, I'm leaning on the promises of you, Jesus. That's the route we should go. And this is critical. John 17, 3. John 17, 3. We'll have it on the screen as well. 
John 17, 3. These are Jesus' last words to his disciples before the passion. Now this is eternal life. That's why a lot of people are in church, why a lot of people read the Bible. They want eternal life. That's what they're aiming for. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Wait, eternal life is knowing God? That just sounds so, I don't know, relationshipy, I guess. What do you mean eternal life is knowing? Wait, wait knowing you? Absolutely. This is eternal life. It's knowing me, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Not what you know, but who you know. And this is all throughout the Bible. Even the Old Testament, Jeremiah 9, 23 and 26. We're about to wrap up. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 26 says, This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom, nor the strong boast of their strength, nor the rich boast of their riches. But let anyone who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to what? To know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice and righteousness on earth, for in these I delight, declares the Lord. Watch this. Keep on reading. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will punish all who are circumcised only in the flesh. Wait, wait, but, we, but we're circumcised. We did, we, we've obeyed the law. No, 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 no. No, I'm calling you out, those who are only circumcised in the flesh. Egypt, Judah, Edom, Ammon, Moab, and all who live in the wilderness in distant places, for all these nations are really uncircumcised. And even the whole house of Israel is uncircumcised where? And you thought only Paul came up with that. You thought it was Paul who talked about, oh, circumcision of the heart, that's what really matters. It started in the Old Testament. God saw it from the very beginning, Jeremiah 29. I'm sorry, Jeremiah uh, 31, 31 through 33, where he, he says, a new covenant I give to you will not be like the old covenant. I will write it in your hearts and in your minds. And no longer will a neighbor have to teach one another saying, know the Lord for all, he says, will know me. God has always wanted to get to the heart because this is the heart of the problem. The, the, the issue is, sin comes down to not knowing God. It's always been that. If Adam and Eve knew God the way they should have known God, would they have taken the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? They wouldn't have. Would Lucifer have made the accusations that he made if he knew God the way he should have known him? This is the problem that we have. In fact, in, in 1 John chapter 3, he says, if you continue to sin, it only proves this one thing. You've never known God and you've never seen him. God is wanting to be known by you. And that's why he comes to earth. For that reason alone. If it's simply about dying, he would have shown up and be here, just be here for six hours and been done with it. But there was so much more to know and understand. He says, I don't want them to think I'm just some crazy person nailed to a tree. I want them to know me. Because eternal life is a relationship with God. It's knowing God. And that is why he's not going to give us a time of when he's going to come. Because when you know him, time is irrelevant. Let me say this again. When you know God and you know that knowing him is eternal life, it does not matter when he comes. Hello? Peter says, the reason Jesus delays is not because he's lazy, he's unorganized. He says he delays so that no one is lost. When you know that, you say, oh, Lord, take your time. Because you're not in it just for yourself. You're in it for everyone else around you. And that's what matters to you. Oh, don't come yet, Jesus, because I need more people to know who you are. And I need to do my job of making sure I make you known as well. So take your time, Lord. Everyone fell asleep in this parable. The five wise ones and the five foolish ones. Paul fell asleep. John fell asleep. Peter fell asleep. Mary fell asleep. 
There's nothing wrong in falling asleep. But there were those who fell asleep knowing Jesus and those who fell asleep that did not know him. And the question is, do you know him? Because at the end of time, no one's going to be lost because they were too late. You think Jesus is going to be like, oh, if you were just a second sooner? Oh, I'm so sorry. If I had just hung on the cross a little bit longer, I could have saved you. No one's going to be lost on a technicality. It's simple. Do you know him? And this is what our opportunity is. The only reason why we're in the word, the only reason why we read scripture is to know who God is. And when we know him, when we see him, the Bible says by beholding him, we become what? And I'm telling you, we live in a world today, a lot of people that don't know him. They know about him, they do not know him. I've talked to enough Christians that, 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 that will profess Christ but have no qualm at all about bombing anyone around the world. And I'm like, do you not know Jesus? He came to his people when they were oppressed by Rome and he didn't drop one bomb. If anything, you would say he love-bombed them. Turn the other cheek. Do good to those who harm you. Do you not know him? God is not ending the war, the great controversy, through bloodshed. If he was going to do that, he would have done that in the beginning. He would have chopped off Lucifer's head and said, done. But he chose a different path, and you are called to walk in that same path. So it matters. Not what you know, but who you know. For this is eternal life. If there's someone here today, as I invite the praise team to come forward, if there's someone here today that wants to say, I've known about him, I got information, I've read the prophecies, I understand this, but I'm be honest with you, I'm not sure if I know him, know him. I've served him, I've been appointed to offices, but I really want that knowledge that is personal and intimate. A knowledge that I know that if I didn't have enough oil, I can knock on his door because I know him and he knows me. If that's where you are and that is your prayer, I'm going to ask you to pray with me right now. Father God, thank you so much. You know those who are lifting their hands, those who are opening their hearts to you. They want it to go finally from their head to their heart knowing that eternal life, that heaven itself is really knowing you. That we read the Old Testament to know you. We read the New Testament to know you. We pray to know you. We come to church to know you. And that should inform our decisions because we know you. We know who to follow. We know who to trust. So Father, may that be the only thing that drives us moving forward is seeing you, God, seeing you. No, you, you didn't make it more difficult. In fact, because we know you, we know how the story of the rich young ruler ends. You say it's impossible for man, but with God, all things are possible. And we know you, and we know you'll make all things possible. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.